Hello brothers and sisters, welcome to our Bible study on James 1. As mentioned in the introduction last week, James centers a lot about faith and practical applications. So this is immediately evident as we tackle on trials and temptations in chapter 1. Let me ask you first, what and how do you do when you are faced with trials and temptations? I hope James could help us with that. But before we proceed to our Bible study, let us first pray. Lord, we want to thank you for guiding our Bible study throughout the year. As we embark on the last book that we will tackle for the year, may you help us remember that when we experience life start as ours, this gives us the opportunity to all the more have faith in you and persevere. May your name be honored as we continue to study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Bible verse memorization challenge for tonight is taken from James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Hi everyone! Today we'll be discussing the first half of James chapter 1. According to John MacArthur, the book of James presents us with a series of tests to prove the genuineness of our faith. And first in the series, trials. What are trials? Are they necessary? How do they fit into God's plan? How do we respond to them? These are some of the questions we'll be answering tonight. But before we begin, let us first commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you with humble hearts to ask for wisdom as we study your word. Trials are not something we are ready to face, but we know they are part of your good plan for us. Please strengthen our hearts and help us understand your purpose. If possible, spare us from trials. Otherwise, help us to see things through your eyes so we will not lose courage and give up. Help us to keep trusting you, knowing that your grace will always be enough to see us through whatever difficulties we face. We commit our hearts, our minds, and our time of study into your hands. Thank you, Lord, for being here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Was there a moment in your life when your world suddenly comes crashing down? When you lose your job or your business goes bankrupt? Your marriage starts falling apart or your child strays? You discover that a family member is terminally ill or you lose a loved one? I remember the last few days of Zion. We witnessed her life slowly slipping away. As we tried to grasp onto whatever hope was left, it felt like we were grasping sand like God refused to move. We prayed and cried to the Lord day and night, but no help came. That time, it felt like my faith was hanging by a single thread, and I wondered how my heart would respond if God takes Zion away. Trials are nothing new. Since the time of the Old Testament, men of God have had their faith tested through trials. Even though we know how their story ends, we still find it difficult to shake off feelings of dread when the Bible talks about trials. In this chapter, James begins by addressing the first century Jewish Christians who were being aggressively pursued and persecuted by King Herod Agrippa I. It was a dark hour in their lives, so James writes to reassure them that trials are part of God's good and perfect plan for his people. James begins by identifying himself and reminding his readers of who they are. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. 
Even though James held a significant position in the Jerusalem church, he could have said, James, the leader of the church, or the pastor of the first church, or the brother of the Messiah. Instead, James identified himself a bond servant. Unlike a regular servant who enters a limited contract, a bond servant or doulos is permanently bound to his master and receives no payment for his services. He is like a slave, except that this slave willingly binds himself to the master. Being a bond servant is a lifelong commitment, and that is how James sees himself willingly and permanently serving God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now James reminds his readers that just as he has bound himself to serve God and the Lord Jesus, they too have professed their faith in Jesus Christ. They are his brothers and sisters in the faith. That reasonably includes us in James' target audience, because we too have made a claim to a faith in Christ. Now what are trials? We hear the word everywhere. Court trial, trial period, clinical trial or in a video game our family plays, daily trial. The dictionary describes the word trial as an examination or a test, usually over a limited period of time, to prove something. And looking at our usage of the word, it would mean to prove a person's innocence, or an object or service's quality and value, or a drug's effectiveness and suitability, or an athlete's skill and ability. Different versions of the Bible use the words trial, troubles, and temptations interchangeably, but if we look at the original Greek text, James used the word pyrasmos, which means a putting to proof by experiment of something good or experience of something evil or by solicitation, discipline, or provocation. Both the dictionary and the original Greek definition agree that trials are events or tests that are meant to prove something. The Apostle Peter gives a clearer picture on the role trials play in a believer's life. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Trials are tests to prove the genuineness of our faith, but trials are simply means to achieve something greater, and that is to share in Christ's glory when He returns. While Peter tells us that trials are meant to test and prove our faith real so we may share in the glory of our Lord Jesus, James explains how trials can prove our faith real. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What is endurance? The dictionary describes endurance as to continue in the same state or to undergo especially without giving in. Endurance is an active word. For an athlete, it is their ability to maintain competitive and training focus while withstanding external physical pressure over time. Other Bible versions use the words patience, perseverance, or steadfastness. Interestingly, the word used by James in the original Greek text was hupomone. This means cheerful or hopeful endurance. It also has the element of constancy in enduring. It's a patient kind of waiting, and one that does not stop. Putting these two definitions together, we can say endurance is the ability to trust the Lord without wavering while withstanding hardship or adversity. Genuine faith will keep trusting God. James tells us that trials are opportunities to produce endurance as proof of our faith's genuineness. And the more we endure, the more we mature, and the more confident we become to meet our Lord. You may be wondering, why do these words sound so familiar? The Apostle Paul gave the same exhortation to the Christians in Rome. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Now there are three of them sharing the same view in trials. 
Peter says, Rejoice, for trials prove the genuineness of our faith. Paul says, Rejoice, for trials develop endurance, which develops strength of character. And James says, Consider it all joy, for trials produce endurance, so that we may be perfect and complete. James added, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let us trust God's purpose and respond in joy. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. R.C. Sproul further explained, Trials can be considered pure joy only when there is knowledge that they are designed by God for a purpose. They are tests of faith given in order to develop perseverance. In turn, perseverance produces mature Christian character. So we can rejoice when we know that what we are gaining is far greater than what we are losing. To recap, in the face of trials, let us endure to mature. And knowing God's purpose is the perfection of our character, let us respond in joy. Trusting God doesn't mean passively accepting God's plan. It requires an active submission to God's will. In other words, obedience. James tells us what we must do in order to know God's will. We go back to God and His Word. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that person ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. God is the source of true wisdom. The Apostle Paul, even though a very intelligent and learned man himself, said, How impossible it is for us to understand God's decisions and His ways! For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give Him advice? One reason we should ask God for wisdom is that His wisdom is far above ours. James gives us more reasons to ask of God. God gives wisdom generously. If we sincerely seek to know God's ways, God will give wisdom willingly and abundantly, without blaming or finding fault in us. He will not judge our worthiness or hold our past mistakes against us. And the best part is, when we ask, God will give it to us. It pleases God when we ask Him for wisdom, because it means we seek to do His will. Remember, when we feel lost in the face of trials, God's offer of help is readily available. But God's offer goes with one condition. We must ask in faith. We must completely trust whatever answer God provides according to His Word, and be willing to completely submit to whatever God tells us. The problem with us is, sometimes we don't ask. We do everything but ask God. And sometimes we ask, but we refuse to read God's Word. Sometimes we ask and receive, but we refuse to submit. James strongly spoke against the double-minded. They were the people who sought God's wisdom, but still decided to do as they please. A couple of months ago, I was asking Gaylord what variant of bottled sardines I should buy online. I couldn't decide among a whole array of flavors. After giving me his choices for our family, I pondered over his advice and proceeded to check out with my own picks in the grocery cart, disregarding the ones he made. As Gaylord would say, Nagtanong ka pa. How many times have we done that to God? We asked to know his will, but still settled for what we wanted. A double-minded man cannot decide whether he should follow God's wisdom or give in to his selfish desires. On the one hand, he wants to know what God has to say, having surrendered himself to Christ's Lordship. On the other hand, he finds the world's solution too irresistible. It just hits the mark and makes God's wisdom look inadequate. James warns us against doubting God's wisdom. He said that if we cannot make up our minds on whom to pledge our loyalty, we cannot expect to receive anything from God the next time we ask. To recap, 
In the face of trials, let us trust God's wisdom by submitting to His will. It is not just wisdom that we need from God, we also need to trust God's provision. During the time of James, the first century Christian Jews became victims of dispossession, deprivation, racism, and bigotry. As a result, many of them were very poor and even lost status in society. But their humble circumstance brought them closer to God and taught them to completely depend on Him. So James writes, Now the brother or sister of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, but the rich person is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So also the rich person in the midst of his pursuits will die out. Trials have a way of putting things into proper perspective. A believer brought to a lowly or humble position learns that even when all is stripped away, he has God, and God is more than enough. You see, his identity does not lie on the material wealth he owns or on the earthly status he possesses. It lies in Christ, and those whose faith are in Christ don't have to fear what the world may do to them. Trials and suffering are a part of life. But as believers, we consider them temporary because we look forward to God's promise of a perfect life in a new body and in a brand new world. So while we wait, let us depend on God's provision of grace to help us endure, knowing that our place in God's eternal kingdom is something that no one can take away. In the same way, one who is blessed with earthly wealth and status should boast that his security lies in God alone. While money may settle some of his issues, it will not completely solve his problems. A broken family, a dying child, a lost wife, it doesn't matter how much wealth he owns, none of it can buy his way out of those trials. In the end, both poor and rich are brought to the same level of dependency on God. That's the point of trials. They humble us. They make us realize how fragile life is and teach us not to depend on earthly possessions that will soon perish. So we learn to fully depend on God, knowing all that we need are in Him and He is all we need. To recap, in the face of trials, let us humbly trust God's provision, acknowledging our total dependence on Him. In the verses that follow, James addresses these two questions. Who tempts us to sin? How serious is sin? No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has run its course, brings forth death. We just learned that trials can produce endurance. But sometimes these trials may turn into situations that lead to temptations. How do we know if we are being tested or being tempted? R.C. Sproul explains that there is an important difference between the concepts test and tempt. Trials or tests are outward circumstances that we experience like poverty, illnesses, broken relationships, while temptations may be external and internal. External temptations happen when Satan entices us to sin, and internal temptations arise from the sinful desires within us. Sproul further clarified, while God tests people, but he never tempts them in the sense of enticing them to sin. Jesus, in the wilderness, was tested by God and tempted by Satan. Jesus, being free of original sin, was tempted externally, but not internally. Now we've established that God does not tempt, though some still try to reason their way out of sin and indirectly blame God for their actions. It is God who put me in this circumstance, or isn't it God who created me like this? In other times, they go with a more convenient excuse. The devil made me do it. We often give Satan too much credit for his tempting powers, but we fail to recognize that we are drawn away by our own sinful desires. To quote Matthew Paul, Lust has a greater hand in sin than either the devil or his instruments, who cannot make a sin without ourselves. 
they sometimes tempt and do not prevail. So Satan certainly tempts us, but the only reason his temptation has a hook in us is because of our own fallen nature. So trials which are meant to test our faith and allow those who endure to mature may turn into situations that tempt us when our sinful desires are enticed to do evil. James tells us that these desires eventually give birth to sinful actions. We start to doubt God, ignore His wisdom, and reject His provision. Many do not see the seriousness of sin, but the Bible is clear in how sin, after it completes its work in us, gives birth to death. This progression to death is an unavoidable result that Satan always tries to hide from us. His great strategy and temptation is to convince us that following our corrupt desires will still give us life, and even a better one at that. As believers, we know that is a lie. Our God who gives life does not tempt us with evil, for desires that are evil can never give birth to life. To recap, in the face of trials, when we are tempted to sin, don't blame God. Temptations come from our own corrupted desires. James continues by giving us more reasons to trust God. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of His will, He gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. We hear the words, God is good, all the time. But when unpleasant things happen, God's goodness is suddenly questioned. James reminds us that all that is good in our lives come from God, and God's goodness is perfect and unchanging. His ways, plans, and purpose were good and perfect then, and still are at the present, and will always be. And His standard of what is good never changes, because God's character does not fluctuate. David Guzik describes how God's goodness is comparable to the lights in the heavens. The sun and stars never stop giving light, even when we can't see them. When night comes, the darkness isn't the fall of the sun, it shines as brightly as before. Instead, the earth has turned from the sun and darkness comes. God's goodness is perfect and unchanging, and the greatest good we can possess is a transformed life through His Son, Jesus Christ. God chose meaning out of His own will. He gave birth or recreated us, giving us a new life. By His true word, His promise of salvation through Jesus Christ, so we may be holy, like Him, and become His prized possessions. That's God's perfect plan. To recap, in the face of trials, let us trust God's goodness and plan, knowing His goodness never changes, and His plan is always perfect. How did Zion's story end? It was on the last day of 2021 when I received a message from Gaylord saying Zion had gone home to be with the Lord. Even though she already fell into a coma the night before, it still felt surreal to think that I won't see her anymore. No more cute chuckles and impish smiles. Zion won't be coming home. But true to his promise, God saw us through our trial. His word became our source of comfort, and the love and prayers of brothers and sisters became a source of strength. Despite our sorrow, the Lord showed us that His ways are indeed perfect, and His heart is always good. And as we experience the abundance of God's grace up to this day, we can say with confidence, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do not lose heart in the face of trials, because the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Let me share a song written by our brother Dana Condon to remind us that trials are part of God's good design. Blessings, problems, triumphs, tragedies are all 
design to bring us to the Lord. Laughing, crying, good times, misery are all designed to bring us to the Lord. The Lord works all things together for our good. To those whom He loves, He shows His design. Till we all see Jesus as the center of our lives and bring everything to His glory. Struggles, freedom, failures, victories, all designed to bring us to the Lord. Friendships, heartaches, farewells, longing hearts are all designed to bring us to the Lord. The Lord works all things together for good to those whom He loves. He shows His design Till we all see Jesus As the center of our lives And bring everything to His glory Blessings, problems, triumphs Tragedies of design to bring us to the Lord, laughing and crying, good times, even misery are all designed with your best in mind. Yes, it's all ordained by the one who reigns. Everything is all designed to bring us to the Lord. May the Lord bless our time of discussion and fellowship. Good evening. We trust tonight's Bible study has challenged us to trust in God in life's darkest hour. Join us again next Friday night as Brother Gaylord D. concludes our study of James chapter 1 with a message entitled, Listening and Doing. This Sunday, we welcome you to join us on site as we worship the Lord together at 10 a.m. Our speaker, Brother Enjoy Gao, will share from Psalm 37, Principles to Remind Us, don't worry, be wise. Good night and God bless.